afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to our webinar, Emerging Trends in Sales Practices Litigation. Uh, my name is Trent Taylor. Uh, I'm a partner here at McGuire Woods, and I will be your MC for this program. Uh, we're very excited to have you with us uh, here today and for our program. And we were, frankly, a little surprised by how many folks signed up for our program, not because we didn't intend to do a good job, but, um, but I, I think it really speaks to how this topic is one that is on everyone's mind right now. Um, and we're going to talk about why that is in a little bit uh, about why this is spiking right now, uh, what types of cases we're seeing, and what maybe you can do to mitigate the risk. So let's start with, here's our panel. Um, as I mentioned, I'm Trent Taylor. We also have Jenny Price, and we have Frank Talbot. Uh, all three of us are in the Richmond office of McGuire Woods, and we work very closely together and have dealt with all of the issues we will be discussing today. And we've dealt with them in both the litigation context as well as on a regulatory basis. Uh, we defend a ton of class actions, sometimes together, sometimes not together, uh, and, and on, on a, a number of different types of class actions in the product space. Uh, a lot involve labeling, but also involving sales practices. Um, here is the roadmap of what we're going to be talking about today. Um, I'm going to start with a few minutes of setting the table. Uh, Frank is going to talk about dark pattern litigation. Uh, Jenny's going to then talk about a subset of dark pattern litigation, which is hidden fee litigation. I will talk about right to repair. Um, we will briefly hit some of similar claims out there, and then we'll lastly talk about mitigating risk and defending against such claims. Uh, one thing I did want to note up front is feel free to ask questions. There's a, a button where you can ask a question and we will try to answer it. Um, and if we don't answer it on this particular program, we can contact you afterwards with an answer. But the other thing that I wanted to note is we love talking and thinking about these types of issues. So if you ever have a question uh, or just want to talk about it, you know, hey, Trent, hey, Jenny, hey, Frank, I'm, I'm sort of concerned about this particular issue. Um, should I be concerned? Uh, what should I do about that kind of thing? Feel free to give us a call or, give us, or shoot us an email anytime because we're happy to help uh, on these things. Um, one programming note, uh, as some of you know, we typically hold a quarterly webinar on food and product labeling class actions, and, and as well as regulatory matters. And, we typically try to have a little fun with it. Uh, our next one is scheduled for June 8th at 12 noon Eastern, and our theme is Purple Raspberry Bourbon. Yes, I know that is oddly specific, um, and there's a story behind it, which I will not explain right now, maybe, but maybe briefly. Uh, it will be celebrating National Bourbon Day as well as the birthday of a certain late iconic singer who likes purple things and raspberry hats. Uh, so we would love for you to join us for that program if you can. All right, so let's get into it. I'm going to set the table quickly uh, and talk about why this type of litigation matters and why you should care. Let's start with what is a sales practice. It's essentially anything other than a label that is used to persuade a customer to spend money on a product or service. And, and litigation targeting sales practices have been around for a long time. Typical type of case you would see is a false reference or phantom discount pricing case uh, at a brick and mortar stores. Uh, so, you know, this particular retailer, um, they are saying something is 30% off, but in reality, that's the same price they have every day. So, it tries to create the illusion of savings. Um, and when, when, when it, it, there actually is not any savings at all, it's the same price. Um, and we used to see, I don't know, one or two a month of those filed here and there. But the reason why we're talking about this type of litigation today is because there has been a recent significant spike in filings. And let me show you the numbers. Um, I'm, I'm a data guy. I like seeing data. It's not enough for someone to say, I sort of have a feeling that maybe these cases are um, spiking right now. I like to have data. And here's the data. So as you can see, and I'm going to show you a different slide that has the same numbers on it, 
but you see the upward trajectory there. Um, and from June 1 of last year until the end of the year, so the last six months of 2021, there were only about six of these cases filed. But in March of this year, there were 15 filed. In April, there were 27 filed. So obviously, something happened to where there's a lot more of these cases now. Where are they being filed? Um, mostly in California, mostly in California state court, but there have been some, um, when they're filed in federal court, they typically filed in either the central district or the northern district of California. There are also some um, in New York federal courts, as well as a few in Florida courts in Massachusetts. All right, who's filing these things? Well, here's the law firms. And, for, and I think the, the important takeaway here is that all of these law firms, these plaintiff's counsel law firms, they operate in the food and uh, product labeling space. They typically file a lot of these class actions, and they seem to have opened up a new front, transitioning from labels to now sales practices. And um, the, the Lynch Carpenter firm, they have mainly focused on false reference pricing, which we'll talk about here in just a little bit. Friedman mostly focused on non-refundable policies. Uh, those are maybe a little more garden variety. Uh, the ones that really watch are Bursar and Fisher and Michael Reese. They're very well funded, they are sophisticated, and the fact that they believe it is worthwhile to invest in this type of litigation is troubling for defendants. It, 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 it seems like we're on the cusp of a lot more of this kind of litigation um, to come, and that's why we're talking about it. Uh, the types of litigation that we're seeing, um, we're seeing hidden fees, we're seeing automatic renewal, false reference pricing, and not refundable. And here are the, the, the raw numbers, um, 22 um, for hidden fees, um, which is a lot. It's double the number of any other one. Um, and that's something, like I said, it's a subset of dark pattern that Jimmy will be talking about. Uh, I also wanted to flag automatic renewal and manipulation reviews because those are also significant. Um, quickly, and we'll talk about some of these a little bit later, uh, here are some recent results in these cases from just the last few months. Um, and there are obviously some older cases as well, but I think this is particularly significant in that um, the takeaway is a lot of these are surviving motions to dismiss. And when that happens, that means other plaintiffs counsel notice and they start filing more of these lawsuits. I think this the 11th Circuit case, uh, Cavalieri, is particularly significant. That's something Jimmy's going to talk about a little bit later. But the 11th Circuit, many would say, is a fairly conservative court. And if they are reversing dismissals, I think that says something. Um, about what we might see down the road in this type of litigation. Also, I wanted to note the Apple case real quick. Uh, Apple has been a big target, but uh, this one particular case having to do with iCloud storage was dismissed earlier um, this month. Uh, I think they're going to have an opportunity, the plaintiffs will have an opportunity to replead. But this is one to closely watch because this decision and the arguments made by defendants in this particular case or a possible blueprint on how to defend these cases. So um, here are the takeaways. I'm not going to dwell on them. The big one is I think there's a wave of this type of litigation that is coming, if not already here, and we expect more of, more of these type of suits, and I think it's important to understand the allegations and how to defend them, and that's what we're going to be discussing. So with that, I will turn it over to Frank. Thank you, Trent. Um, again, I'm Frank Talbot, and I'll be covering uh, some dark pattern litigation issues, uh, absent hidden fee stuff that Janiel uh, touched on later, where uh, we've seen sort of the most litigation uh, in recent months. So um, I'll start with a hypothetical. I know some of you all here probably received an email from one of us inviting you all, um, but others hypothetically might have just been perusing the McGuire Woods website thinking, I'll see what McGuire Woods does. And so you get a pop-up that says, join us for a webinar about dark patterns. You have two options, yes or no, not now, and you're 
to pop up, you're kind of bothered by it. No, not right now. Keep perusing a couple minutes later, same pop up. Okay, you're nagging me now. Um, sure, I'll see what this is all about. So you hit the yes button. Um, and great, we're glad to have you. Um, all you have to do is enter your email to join our webinar and learn all about dark patterns. Um, and you see that you can either enter your email or you can set, you can click out uh, saying, no, I like ignoring potential risks in e-commerce. Well, uh, of course, you don't like uh, the suggestion that you wouldn't be interested in ignoring potential risks. So, of course, you are just going to enter your email address um, to learn about dark pattern litigation. Um, and so then on the next screen, we uh, thank you for subscribing to our mailing list. And all you have to do is click the link to join the webinar. And there's the link uh, right there. So, uh, and now you're here to learn about dark pattern litigation. Um, and so what we have, uh, dark patterns is, is a term that was ter that was coined about 10, 12 years ago by Harry Brignall. Um, he operates a website, deceptive.design, which was formerly known as darkpatterns.org. And what he did was he identified what he decided were 12 types of, quote, dark patterns in website design. Um, there's a lot of crossover with what they are and, and what might constitute a dark pattern or not, but really it boils down to a couple of characteristics, including a lack of clarity, suggestive language, varying information, withholding information, false comparisons, and then multi-steps. Um, these are really no different than our, what we would think of as traditional deceptive practices. Um, and just from the previous four slides, we've hit a lot of them uh, in terms of lack of clarity. The very first slide saying opt in, don't opt out, don't not opt in uh, is kind of confusing. Uh, you have suggestive language suggesting that you like ignoring risks in e-commerce. Um, well, of course I don't. I'm, I'm very interested in it. Uh, you have the burying of information. Uh, on the previous slide, there was, uh, there was cancellation info uh, about how to cancel your subscription to our mailing list. Um, withholding information. Uh, we didn't even tell you by entering your email you were subscribing to our list. Uh, and then there's the multi-step uh, facet of this. Uh, if you read the fine print uh, at the bottom of the last email uh, of the last screen, uh, to cancel your subscription, you first had to call the Richmond office of McGuire Woods to obtain one set of paperwork that you then had to have delivered to the San Francisco office of McGuire Woods so that you could then obtain the final cancellation paperwork, which you would receive by fax, which you would then have to return by hand delivery to the McGuire Woods uh, London office to be able to cancel your, uh, your subscription. Uh, so those are just sort of some uh, hypothetical examples that we'll get into in a couple of these cases. Um, but it, it, it really highlights, um, and it sort of runs the gamut. Uh, some stuff, sure, it might be suggestive to say, no, I don't like, no, I like ignoring risks in e-commerce. But at the same time, having you call one office on the East Coast to submit something to, to the West Coast office to then submit something to an overseas office to cancel uh, certainly makes it quite difficult to um, unsubscribe. Um, before we get into the litigation portion, I did just want to flag that there are regulation issues. Um, at the federal level, the Federal Trade Commission last year put on uh, a seminar called Bringing Dark Patterns to Light. Uh, and as you'll see as we talk about some of these cases, uh, a, a number of the consumer class action cases were preceded by FTC actions. Uh, in terms of uh, other federal agencies, the Consumer Protection Financial Bureau recently uh, filed a credit monitoring complaint against TransUnion uh, related to their uh, enrollment of people allegedly for a free credit report, but it then auto enroll them into a monthly subscription. Uh, again, that's something that you see in the, in the consumer um, litigation aspect. Um, then there's also legislation that's been pending uh, filed in the Senate, the Deceptive Experiences to Online Users Reduction Act or DETOUR Act that makes uh, 
these sort of dark pattern uh, issues uh, more explicitly under the FTC's control. Um, and that's been introduced by Virginia's Senator Mark Warner um, and has some bipartisan uh, sign-off as well. Um, and in terms of state regulation, uh, their attorney general actions uh, a couple months ago, the attorney general for uh, the District of Columbia filed suit against Google related to uh, data tracking for Android users, basically saying the default settings for sharing your location data and a host of other information. Uh, you didn't make it clear that the default was to basically share everything. And, um, you know, you had some suggestive language saying that to run certain apps, you, you really needed the information when you didn't. Uh, and the opt-in and opt-out was either opt-all-in or opt-all-out. And when you opted out, uh, it continually sort of popped up and said, are you sure, are you sure, are you sure? Um, and then in the international space, uh, there's European regulation as well. Um, but something that uh, caught my eye was the Competition and Markets Authority in the UK uh, recently uh, secure, secured changes uh, for Microsoft Xbox users related to auto renewal. Um, a couple of things that Microsoft agreed to do was pinging uh, inactive users to make sure they knew they were still being charged a monthly subscription price, giving them the opportunity to opt out, things like that. So um, we'll start with a couple of cases related to the unintended sharing of user data. Uh, and the, the first case is, that I have is the Henry Plaid privacy litigation. Um, Plaid is a uh, is a service that apps use to connect to bank accounts, um, and they utilize banking credentials. Uh, and the allegations were that they were selling users' financial data uh, for their profit. And the allegations were that the agreement that users um, were allowing Plaid to track this data was just really obscured and opaque. So from the complaint in that case, um, that example used is a uh, user trying to set up a Venmo account. And so they're in the process of setting up Venmo, and then a screen pops up and it says Venmo to use as Plaid. Uh, and someone says, okay, that's fine. Um, but then at the bottom, just before the continue button, it says, by, con by selecting continue, you're agreeing to the Plaid user and privacy agreement. Uh, and so the allegations were that there wasn't a hyperlink. The information was buried related to what data Plaid might collect and share. Uh, essentially, a user had to click continue. A user couldn't click a hyperlink to the Plaid terms and conditions or the Plaid privacy, privacy uh, terms. And, and it would take a lot for the user to find out what those terms were, to find out like, what sort of information they were agreeing to. Um, ultimately, uh, they settled preliminary approved last November, um, and they just had the final approval hearing a couple of days ago, but awaiting the final order. Uh, and the final settlement amount for that was about $58 million. Um, there have been other similar uh, cases like this, TikTok, uh, consumer privacy litigation, um, this is one of the cases that discussed the previous uh, FTC action. So the FTC had taken some action related to some of the allegations that TikTok was uh, tracking user data and transferring it to third parties for targeted ads uh, and all of that. And so um, this was a follow-on uh, consumer class action. Um, and much like the Plaid privacy litigation, uh, it settled for about $92 million dollars uh, got preliminary approval, um, and then the final approval has been taken under advisement. Um, so Plaid and TikTok were about user financial data and, and location services and stuff like that, but um, Snapchat recently got hit with a class action uh, that relates to um, the Illinois Biometrics Information Privacy Act, which at the highest level requires disclosures if you're going to track biometrics, uh, including face scans. And as you'll probably guess, Snapchat, uh, you know, it's all pictures, it's all biometric stuff. 
Uh, and so the allegations there were that um, the filters that use face biometrics, um, users weren't told that, that that was being tracked or being sold. Frank, can I just add one thing on that? Um, actually, two things real quick. So um, that biometric thing, I think, is important and something to really watch out for. Um, the other thing that, that I've seen it used on is, like, if you're buying eyeglasses online and you're trying to do the virtual try-on, you know, there have been some lawsuits, class actions filed about gathering that information, those, that facial data uh, for the virtual try-on. I, I know that there are some other of these suits out there, including one in the Southern District of New York. So watch out for that. The other thing I wanted to flag real quick on this unintended sharing is that there have been uh, a fair number of um, class actions filed about, and I call these sort of the analogs, so it's not the e-commerce, but it's about like magazine subscriptions, mm -hmm. uh, where someone, um, there's a company that um, may gather certain data and then they will sell it to uh, you know, an aggregator, that kind of thing. And there's been uh, a fair number of those lawsuits sprinkled here and there um, and sprinkled all, really all over the nation over the last few years. So that's something else to, to be cognizant and be aware of. It's not just e-commerce. It's the sort of analog, uh, brick and mortar, you know, traditional publication things as well. Great. Yeah, thank you. Um, and sort of, sort of put a bow on, on these sorts of unintended sharing of data cases, they fall into the dark pattern uh, issues where the allegations are it's not clear what's being shared. You're not putting up front the ability for the consumer to understand that. And then to actually find it out, you have to go through multiple steps uh, to do it. So um, moving on to, to burying uh, options, uh, Airbnb got hit with a case uh, related to COVID refunds uh, related to cancellations, and the allegations were basically that Airbnb was was forcing consumers to choose uh, between cancellation options uh, that didn't involve uh, full cash refunds, even though those were available. Um, so on this slide, and you'll see the allegations in the complaint specifically re reference this as a dark pattern, uh, attempting to withhold refunds from guests and instead steer them toward the travel credit or other inferior options. Uh, the, the orange highlighting is, is plaintiff's counsel uh, from there. And, and so as you can see, the pre-selected option is the host option, which offers no refund. And then there's a button for a second option, which is a travel credit for a certain amount of money. Um, and only if you read the finer print, which is also offset and hyperlinked, you can select a full cash refund. Um, but the terms of doing that, uh, it requires several additional steps, including submission of additional documentation and substantiation for that. Um, arbitration was compelled, which is something we'll get into uh, sort of at the end. Um, and so with with this sort of bearing the options, while the information wasn't necessarily withheld, the process uh, and the process was maybe clear because um, it, it showed how to get a full refund. It, it hits on the suggestive language or suggestive design such that like your options are really the only two buttons, the no refund or the travel voucher. Um, and again, the sort of multiple steps to try and defeat the consumer at the point. Uh, so uh, next, we have uh, Heinz versus Fashion Nova, which is, is a recent case that's filed in the District of New Jersey under the New Jersey Consumer Fraud Act. Um, and the allegations there were that uh, only four or five star reviews were automatically posted, that Fashion Nova used a vendor to track these. And so if if there was a, a four or five star review that automatically got posted, but if there was a one to three star review, the company got to review it for further consideration. And again, the allegations would be that the consumer, that the company never actually posted the one to three star reviews um, purportedly to make sure that they are, um, you know, much higher rated than consumers would, would actually uh, say. Um, and this, much like the TikTok case, 
uh, comes on the heels of a nearly $5 million settlement with the FTC related to the same allegations. So again, um, sort of you can see a pattern where if the FTC is investigating uh, and, and doing work on an issue uh, with a e-commerce company, then they should be prepared for uh, consumer class action to tag along uh, at the end or even during. Um, I would note with this, uh, even though this sort of hits on the withholding of information and is arguably like a false comparison type dark pattern, um, the National Advertising Division of the Better Business Bureau dealt with uh, a claim from a company that it had 225,000 five-star reviews um, and actually said um, that that was okay, um, but suggested adding qualifiers about how they actually counted and got to that number. And so, uh, again, it sort of goes to the greater theme of the disclosures and what you're telling the consumer. And if you're being upfront about how you're calculating it or how you're dealing with it, it's probably um, fine. So next, we have the phantom discount pricing. Um, and I've got four cases here. They're all by the same uh, firm. And so Rivali versus Shutterfly, uh, and then Ashley Furniture, and Pier 1 Imports, and then Zale Corporation. Uh, all have recently been filed in California. Uh, the complaints are somewhat cut and paste. Uh, but it's a pretty straightforward claim. Uh, you have a false comparison uh, where you're striking out what a, quote, original price was and offering this new discounted price. Um, and under California law, uh, these are all in California, and under California law, uh, for discounts, you can only discount from the original price for 90 days or do a comparison uh, to competitors for uh, 90 days. Um, but the allegation here is, First off, like, it's always been on the website, and they used um, the Wayback Machine to track 90 days, 180 days, uh, and a longer period of time. Um, and so the 90 days was blown, but also they said it, there's no comparison because there's no original price. Like, they never sold it for this price. Um, and so uh, that's, again, that's one of the dark patterns is this phantom pricing, and it's really just like Trent mentioned earlier, uh, you have an ad, you brick and mortar, advertised price, in-store price are different, but it's just a different interaction with the customer because it's online instead of in person. Um, and then the last topic I'll cover uh, is auto enrollment because it kind of flows nicely into the hidden fee issues. Um, uh, so the first case is uh, Nichols v. Noom up in the Southern District of New York, and Noom is a weight loss app that offered a free trial period. Um, and it required you to provide your payment information, and you had a free trial period. And, and the allegations were they didn't disclose to the consumers that after this free trial period, you were going to get charged, and you were going to get charged multi-month membership uh, after the trial period ended. Um, and then even if you figured out that you that was happening, the cancellation process wasn't intuitive. You had to go. You have to go through your personal health coach. You can't just you, the allegations where you couldn't just like log on and go to my account and be like cancel my subscription. It had to be completely different. Um, and again, and as it's noted, this settled for about sixty-two million dollars in cash and credits, and final approval is set for the summer. Um, Octavia, the Octavia case is nearly the same as the Noom case. Uh, what's funny is it uh, it actually references a press release from the FTC about dark patterns in one of the opening footnotes. Um, and so much like Noom, users were auto-enrolled. Uh, and again, from the complaint, the as you can see, even if you got a free product or a free trial, on the right side it says, congratulations, you're now enrolled in Optiva Prime. And then down at the bottom it has already pre-selected for the consumer that they are part of that program. And then it says, you know, this is subject to terms and conditions and all of that. And so the, the point uh, is that you, the 
Tavia isn't being clear. They're automatically enrolling, and they're forcing this continuity, um, and, and the disclosures aren't clear and conspicuous. Um, and so, uh, again, like the Noom case, the process for cancellation allegedly is, is very convoluted, and, and it's not just as simple as clicking a button or two. Um, and then this last case, uh, Heck versus Amazon, uh, filed by Reese uh, LLP uh, within the past week, um, similar to Noom and Octavia, uh, talks about Amazon signing up for Amazon Prime membership, and as part of that, you get free titles at Audible. But uh, allegedly, consumers don't understand that Audible is separate, and it, you have to do that content with a separate monthly fee. Um, and much like Noom and Octavia, um, it surreptitiously enrolls people in the process. And then to, again, unsubscribe theme, uh, multi-step process that just uh, consumers allegedly don't want to go through. Um, so with that, I can turn it over to Jenny. Thanks, Frank. Uh, it's good to be with you guys this afternoon. I'm going to talk about the hidden fee litigation. As Trent mentioned earlier, there are about 22 cases that were filed since June 1st of 2021, which is a lot. It's a huge hike um, in just you know a little under a year. One of the big takeaways for the hidden fee litigation, too, is that, um, as you'll see from my slides, that they cover a lot of different um, consumer products, and they're surviving summary judgment motions. Um, sort of across the country. So uh, with that, I'll get into where a lot of the uh, new hidden fee litigation has been directed, and that's at food delivery services. So here there are um, three cases that I'm going to talk about. Two of them were, were brought um, either by an AG or uh, the city of Chicago. Those are the first two. So this Grubhub uh, case was brought by the AG, it's an AG action out of the District of Columbia, filed in the Superior Court for the District of Columbia, um, and the allegations are that Grubhub charges hidden fees over its advertised delivery fees and makes uh, restaurants put the bill for purported discount program. Um, they also allege that Grubhub fails to distinguish between a pickup and delivery fee uh, when they just advertise um, order online for free, um, where the only free aspect would be the pickup rather than de the delivery. Um, that's one of the other allegations. And then they also um, accuse uh, Grubhub and allege that they Grubhub created these micro sites, um, which look like restaurant. Um, you're ordering directly from the restaurant, but in actuality, you're ordering from Grubhub and you know, your food will be delivered by Grubhub. Um, so that's going to be an interesting one to watch. And then with the DoorDash, um, again, that was filed in Chicago, uh, the Northern District of Illinois, uh, where the City of Chicago Law Department is alleging unfair and deceptive trade practices for hidden fees on purportedly higher um, menu items and on hidden delivery fees um, and in not providing 100% of the tips to the drivers. Um, the motion to dismiss was recently dismissed in that case, so it's off to the races in that. Um, I would also note that there are similar suits against Grubhub and Uber Eats in both New York City and San Francisco. And then finally, this week, Chick-fil-A got hit um, uh, facing a, a new class action down in Miami-Dade State Court um, in Florida. They're alleging, similar to uh, DoorDash, that Chick-fil-A is not disclosing um, that it charges higher costs for delivery menu items. So, you know, you may pay one thing for your delicious uh, chicken nuggets um, at Chick-fil-A in the store, and then the, the price is uh, higher when you're ordering off of the delivery menu, um, and that there's it's not really a flat delivery fee as Chick-fil-A advertises. Uh, allegedly, there, um, you know, there's a hidden delivery service fee there. So, I think there are going to be a lot of these um, food delivery cases, um, food delivery service hidden fee cases. Um, these are just a handful of of the ones that I flagged that were pretty recent. Um, the next sort of hot topic or hot area for um, hidden fee litigation is with online ticket purchases. 
And these are two that were just recently filed, um, both filed in California state court. Both come from the same law firm, the Aegis Law Firm. Uh, one is against Vivid Seats, LLC. Um, that one's pending in Orange County. Uh, the allegations there are false advertising action for allegedly advertising ticket prices at one price, but then hiding fees until the checkout after the customer has already entered payment information. And the next is against Game Time United. Um, that's pending in San Francisco Superior Court, the class action uh, alleging unfair competition, unfair business practices, and consumer warranty for um, Game Time allegedly is uh, – creating a bait and switch pricing and hiding additional fees that are purportedly 30 to 166% of the advertised price. Um, I think those are going to be uh, the online ticket purchases. I think we'll also see a, a big increase in, in uh, those uh, class actions and cases across the country. Um, airlines are also not immune to the, the hidden fee litigation. Um, this, this case is pending again in California. Um, Oh, I'm sorry. It's it's not in California. It just got out of the 11th Circuit. Uh, this is the case that Trent was talking about a little bit earlier. Um, this is sort of a unique um, fact pattern for uh, hidden fees because it was originally dismissed um, by the district court because um, the district court held that the Airline Deregulation Act preempted uh, the breach of contract claims. Um, and had dismissed the case. It was appealed to the 11th Circuit that uh, reversed and remanded. Basically, it was saying that um, there, you know, the allegation was there was a breach of contract because you know you paid your ticket price and then the passengers were required to pay an undisclosed quote you know $80 exit fee before they were allowed to board a flight from Miami to Venezuela. And uh, the 11th Circuit said that you know that specific um, allegation was in fact like clearly just a breach of contract action and not did not implicate the airline deregulation act um so there was no preemption um it's a little bit of a different um you know i don't think it's going to obviously be um applied towards other consumer um uh hidden fee class actions just because it, it relates to a very specific airline issue. But um, to the extent that other airlines are going to be implicated, then, you know, it's going to be an important case for them. But it also just highlights the fact that, um, you know, motions to dismiss in this area on the hidden fee um, are, are really, um, you know, it's, it's a hurdle that a lot of defendants aren't clearing right now on the hidden fee litigation. Um, and finally, I'm going to talk about financial services also not being immune from hidden fee litigation. You know, it's been in the, the hidden fee litigation has been in financial services for some time, um, and these are just two examples. Um, one in the Southern District of California, this tail case, um, you know, which is essentially saying that um, this company. Klarna uh, was advertising that purchasers could pay for their products at a later date with no interest fees or hassle, but then purportedly uh, was charging undisclosed fees and interest um, that was resulting in overdraft fees and insufficient funds um, for its customers. And so that case is now pending in the Southern District of California. And then this Fleetwood case, which is a, a mortgage servicing um, company, uh, that's pending in Hamilton County for uh, the Court of Common Pleas in Ohio, and it's alleging that Shell Point Mortgage charges $5 fees when um, its customers pay mortgage payments online or over the telephone. So, um, you know, pretty broad array of consumer products that uh, are being faced with hidden fees, and um, it'll be very interesting to see uh, how all of these play out over the next several months. All right, um, it's back to me now to talk about uh, right to repair litigation, which is a related but sort of different variant, a uh, variant, not a different variant, uh, a variant of what we've been talking about. Um, and it really is it's fascinating, fascinating stuff. And I'm, I'm not going to be able to do it justice in the, the short amount of time where we have to discuss it. It could really be its own program. But 
I did want to introduce the concept and talk a little bit about it because I think there is more to come in this area. So first of all, what is right to repair? It's the notion that when you own a product, you should be able to either repair it yourself or take it to a technician of your choosing. And of course you can legally do that, but whether you can do it practically is really the rub. Um, will you have access to the parts and the information while still retaining things like your warranty um, if you do that? And let me give you an example. So recently our dishwasher and our refrigerator broke at the same time, which was a problem. Um, and in order to maintain the warranties on both of them, we had to use an authorized repair person in parts for both of them. The problem came when we had to wait two weeks just for them to come out to take a look. And uh, I can tell you, having three teenage boys and not having a refrigerator and not having a dishwasher was a problem for us. Um, and so think about that. How many other companies out there have this kind of policy? Um, and you know, that's one of the reasons why right to repair has become really a movement. And it really started with farm equipment and tractors, and now is moving to other products and into the deceptive trade practices class area. So uh, you'll see here, that, you know, the right to repair and right to repair legislation is very popular. Uh, nearly seven in 10 voters like laws that would protect it. Um, and that's really bipartisan. And there's not much bipartisan these days, but that's one of the bipartisan things. I think it's 80% for Democrats, 70% for Republicans. And then 95% of farmers support right to repair laws as well. Um, now, with regard to legislation, there have been some efforts made. Um, there have been a number of sort of federal acts introduced in either the House or the Senate. I have a few of these up here. Um, you know, it's, most of those have some bipartisan um, support. They haven't really gone, um, they haven't been enacted yet. Um, and, you know, those will be things to keep an eye on going forward. Um, half of U.S. states have introduced some similar legislation. Um, here are, is sort of a map of where active right to repair bills are out there, as well as some where they have been introduced in the past. I wanted to go back for just a second and mention Massachusetts. Um, they have a law um, that was enacted back in 2013 and then was amended in 2020 um, that basically required that cars sold in Massachusetts starting with the 2022 model year come equipped with a standardized open access data platform that would allow mechanics and independent repair shops to access that data for diagnostics and repair. So um, an interest group sued uh, the Alliance for Automotive Innovation and claiming that that deadline was too difficult to meet and that automotive manufacturers cannot comply with the law without in turn violating federal safety and environmental laws. Um, that, they were supposed to have a trial for that, I think, last month. It did not happen, but it will happen in the future. It appears that the courts will likely uphold that measure, but we will see and we'll keep an eye on that. Um, regulatory. So, um, I mentioned that it was a movement. There have been, it has become a political hot button to a certain extent. Um, in May of 2021, FTC released a report um, entitled Nixing the Fix, an FTC report to Congress on repair restrictions. It's well worth your read, well, well worth a read um, to get a sense about um, how this operates. It ultimately found that a manufacturer's use of a repair restriction could be challenged as an unfair practice under Section 5 of the FTC Act if the repair restriction causes substantial injury that is not outweighed by countervailing benefits to consumers. Uh, President Biden has spoken about this issue, announced his support for right to repair, and soon thereafter, and I'm sure it's not related at all, uh, but the FTC unanimously uh, voted to increase law enforcement efforts against repair and restrictions. Now, one thing I will note, I don't think we've seen that come to fruition as of yet. Um, they, you know, there's a big you know, press release that they have unanimously voted to do this, but I don't think there, we have seen any of those law enforcement efforts uh, brought to bear as of yet. 
Um, in early 2022, President Biden also spoke with, about the issue and noted there have been positive developments that have occurred recently, including two big companies, Apple and Microsoft, have um, modified their um, uh, policies with regard to repair. Um, so that's sort of the backdrop on this. Now, the litigation, um, this is just to show you that there is the potential for big money at stake. There was a jury verdict of $131 million a few years ago in this space, um, although their retrial was ordered on damages. Uh, and then there was a $95 million settlement um, last year that Apple had. Okay, now I don't want to spend very long on the John Deere cases, but any discussion of litigation in this area has to sort of start there because that's what led to the movement, uh, you know, farm equipment, tractors, that kind of thing. Um, six cases have been filed uh, just this year. Uh, there is a JPML hearing tomorrow to decide whether or not they will be consolidated into an MDL. I will note that these John Deere cases are not consumer cases per se, but not deceptive trade practices cases. They are almost entirely antitrust. So I'm less interested in those, um, but more interested in the crossover from this notion to deceptive trade practices cases, which is happening in other litigation. Um, HP cases, that's where one of the ones uh, to, to watch in particular. There was a case filed uh, last month against HP relating to HP ink and toner supplies uh, and firmware updates that essentially locked out competitors uh, refilled, new build, or remanufactured ink and toner supply cartridges. Um, that will be one to watch. That is the Deceptive Trade Practices Act, and it piggybacks on an earlier very similar suit um, that was filed at the very end of 2020 um, and that particular case, the court just uh, last fall mostly denied defendant's motion to dismiss. So, um, and the court found that plaintiff's allegations are sufficient to state fraud by omission under the various California Consumer Deceptive Trade Practices Act statutes. Um, so, this, particularly the second one here, will be important to watch uh, because that is one of the most mature ones. Um, in this space, and we're going to want to watch it and see what happens. But for now, it is moving along. Um, this one is a wild story. It relates to McDonald's soft serve machines and how they were constantly broken. Um, it's a fascinating story. There's all sorts of articles about there on it, uh, out there on it if you want to find it. I don't want to get too much into it because it involved a lot more than right to repair, but it also had a right to repair element. And this was filed just uh, at the beginning of March in Delaware. Um, basically, plaintiff created software to fix the soft serve machines, and they alleged that McDonald's um, and the other company that actually makes the soft serve machines conspired to exclude them and their particular product from being used. So, something else to keep an eye on in this space. Um, here is one also to watch. It was filed in California in March, was removed last month. It involves um, Apple. As I mentioned earlier, they, they recently modified its policy, but this is their policy where you'll see it uh, near the bottom, only Apple or an AASP should perform service on this Apple product. And like I said, there's a lot of companies that have similar policies. Um, and so this will also be one to watch. They're alleging, you know, um, consumer Consumer Legal Remedies Act and various other unlawful and unfair business practice statutes. Um, another one had to do with Samsung. Um, this was in Iowa, and this sort of goes to what I was talking about earlier. The, the, the really the, the, the allegation here is that Iowa, the state of Iowa, only has one repair technician in the entire state for these dishwashers, um, which could lead to a multi-week backup. And so we're going to see, I think, um, we're going to want to watch this, and we're going to probably see more um, of these type of lawsuits, even if it's not one for the entire state. If folks like me have to wait a couple of weeks to get a technician, then I think you may see um, similar type of lawsuits and class actions filed going forward. 
Um, and then one and two, the last one I wanted to mention, and this was one that was filed in Massachusetts at the beginning of the year in federal court, had to do with Braun Electric Shaver. Um, curiously, did not have a Consumer Deceptive Trade Practices Act claim, uh, but instead focused on Maxim Moss and uh, fraud and fraudulent omission. Um, and it, it was voluntarily dismissed without prejudice uh, back in March. Um, it doesn't appear to be a settlement. I think it may get refiled at some point. Uh, but I think the bottom line in, in this particular case exemplifies this, is that we're sort of at the very beginning of this kind of litigation, and plaintiff's counsel is still trying to feel things out, test different theories, and we're going to want to watch very closely because I think we're going to see a lot more of these cases, and I think now is the time to understand this risk related to repair policies and to take steps to mitigate that risk if possible. Um, so we're running a little bit short on time, so I'm going to skip the other sales practices targeting litigation, but just realize there are a lot of other variations out there that don't always fit neatly in some of these categories we talked about, and we've provided a few here so that you can look at um, later. And with that, I think we wanted to get into the strategies to mitigate risk and defend litigation. Um, and and to, to start with, I just wanted to say that really, you know, every situation is a little bit different. Uh, and we're not going to obviously be able to get into the nuances here today. Uh, we have advised clients on a lot of these types of issues. And if you want to discuss, always feel free to contact us. But we did want to include a few high-level thoughts. So let me turn it over to Frank and Jenny to talk about some of those, and I may, may chime in as well. Thanks, Trent. Um, so in terms of the dark pattern practices, there's really no bright line rule. Uh, as I mentioned during my piece, it's sort of a sliding scale. Sure, you could have suggestive language, uh, but there's always been suggestive language in advertising and trying to sell the consumer on your product. and so. Um, you really have to think of it holistically and the whole consumer experience. Um, and, and consider how, the cons how you're interacting with the consumer and how it might translate to a brick and mortar setting. Um, for example, if you're trying to, if a, if a company is trying to sneak uh, an item into a consumer's cart uh, online at the end uh, of the transaction, think about it in terms of a grocery store clerk who is trying to uh, scan items and throw them into the consumer's bag in the, in the brick and mortar setting, like that's probably not good. Um, and so you'll also uh, want to consider how you are interfacing uh, with, the with the consumer. Uh, is it a computer screen where you've got a big screen where you can see lots of disclosures? Is it a tablet where it's a bit smaller screen? Or is it a phone where it's even smaller? And even so, is it, is it on the phone through a website, uh, through a browser, or is it through an app? Because the experiences for the consumer can be very different. Um, you also want to consider like where you have sign-in pages, whether you have mandatory scrolling for agreeing to terms and conditions. Um, because like at the very last point, the consent is key. Um, and being able to show that the consumer consents multiple times to the terms and conditions um, and consents to the transaction is, is a good thing because the more you show consent, the less likely it is that you can be accused of trying to hide the ball. Um, which leads into uh, the piece on arbitration clauses that are often contained in terms and conditions and uh, in e-commerce. Uh, recent case uh, against Live Nation, it's an antitrust case, but for our purposes, um, Arbitration was recently compelled, um, and there were allegations that the agreement to the terms and conditions were dark pattern uh, issues because there was no checkbox um, for the consumer to affirmatively acknowledge that they agreed to the terms and conditions that contained the arbitration clause. Um, but there was a good discussion about how uh, browse wrap, which doesn't require really any affirmative uh, clicking, and then click wrap which does, um, there's sort of a middle ground where there were hyperlinks right next to the, to the submit button, and it was pretty clear that you were submitting to the terms and conditions, and you could easily just click it and pop, they popped right up. Um, it, one special rule for California is the McGill rule. Uh, it's a matter of public policy. 
that prohibits arbitration of claims requesting, quote, public injunctive relief. Um, as you can imagine, it can be pretty squishy as to what is public injunctive relief when a lot of these consumer class actions are really just asking for consumers to get their money back, which is not really injunctive relief at all. Um, uh, you know, make the company agree to their terms and conditions isn't really like, uh, it can be very vague and questionable. Um, and so uh, I, I just note that, that it's, while it's California specific, it's and it's unlikely to apply outside of California. It's not guaranteed. Uh, it's the Eastern District of Michigan um, in the past couple of years has actually applied the McGill rule uh, in a consumer class action case. So, um, but the majority of cases have declined to apply it as a, it's California policy, not the state's policy. Um, and then uh, relatedly, there's the class action waiver as everyone can imagine. Uh, the presence of a class greatly increases uh, liability uh, potential, and so um, consider whether your terms and conditions uh, both have that arbitration clause containing the class action waiver or whether a class action waiver just stands um, sort of on its own. Um, and a few other things just wanted to highlight, and we obviously have a, li a lot here that we're not going to tick off all of them um, because obviously you can read as well. But there are a few that I wanted to um, sort of highlight and talk about a little bit. Uh, one is the third one on here. Look at what your peers are doing on their websites. Don't be an outlier. So if everybody else has a checkbox or something else and you don't, then you're an outlier. And, and if a plaintiff's counsel uh, comes across that, you may be the one that gets the demand letter or gets sued. So to a certain extent, there's a little bit of safety in numbers. And if, if you're with everyone else, then you might be fine. But we have seen a lot more industry-wide lawsuits against everybody saying, you're all doing it wrong. So don't blindly trust just because your you know, peers are doing, all doing the same thing. Independently verify that your approach is correct as well. Um, I do think it's helpful to keep up to date on regulatory trends, such as what the FTC is doing, uh, such as what uh, NAD is doing. Um, and you know that's either through maybe the council that you have, maybe through one of our quarterly webinars that you could attend, um, or just you know going to their website, and checking it every so often to make sure. Because a lot of these lawsuits are precipitated, as we saw with what Frank was talking about earlier, um, the FTC action with regard to Fashion Nova then resulted in a number of class action lawsuits. Um, a couple other things, real quick. Um, you know, we talk about uh, negative reviews. I think that's a, an important one. Um, it's been a focus of both the FTC that I just mentioned as well as lawsuits. So I think it's important to know what you're doing there and know what the law is. And that's something that we've advised a number of clients on, and we're happy to help you with that as well. Um, the repair thing that I talked about earlier, you know, I would be very careful with that. I, I really do feel like uh, we're on the cusp of a lot more litigation in this area. And so I think it's worthwhile to understand what Apple and Microsoft recently did, changing their policies. Um, and if they're doing it, then it, it probably makes sense for you to understand what they did and to consider whether or not it makes sense for your company to do something like that. But I think what's the, the takeaway is consider not ma mandating on a bright line basis that consumers use your parts or repair services. I think there's a way to do it that um, may encourage them to still use uh, your parts or repair services without um, you know, bright line mandating it. Um, and then finally, on this particular page, um, you know, be proactive in dealing with consumer complaints. That goes without saying to a certain extent. But if someone is complaining, their next call may be to a lawyer. Um, the best thing you can do is try to uh, take that off the table by addressing their concerns. Um, and then the last slide here are just some other things. Once you get into litigation, some things to sort of uh, note. One, this first one I think is a pretty interesting argument about whether there is an ascertainable loss in a false reference or a phantom discount pricing case. And the Ninth Circuit recently threw it to Oregon, the, the Supreme Court, to decide that. That's obviously a, a, you know, a, a good argument that you can potentially make, and we'll see what the Oregon Supreme Court does about that. 
Um, and then on the motion to dismiss, you know, focus on the reasonable consumer standard and whether it is plausible that the plaintiff didn't know what they were agreeing to or didn't know uh, what the policy was. Um, and as we saw in that Apple case that I flagged earlier in the um, uh, webinar, um, the, the court recently dismissed, earlier this month, dismissed such a, uh, a case against Apple saying, hey, you read the policy, you consented to it, uh, you can't plausibly say you didn't know about it. And that's going to be a blueprint going forward, I think, in some of these cases. Um, and the final thing I'll mention is if you do get to class or one of the things that I think can sometimes be helpful to do, and um, we have all done it here, is gather declarations uh, from consumers who have had positive experiences with your products and sales practices to counter the lawsuit allegations. So, you know, have someone say, well, I didn't have any problem navigating the website. I knew exactly what the policy was. Uh, getting those declarations and submitting them in class cert can help defeat class certification. Um, so that, I think, is everything that I had. Um, Jenny, Frank, anything else, uh, final words you want to add here? Yeah, just to tack on to your point about the friendly declarations, um, just in e-commerce generally, the, your companies are collecting a lot of data on your consumers and also look for other ways that you can utilize that data to show that your consumers benefited from your practice. Uh, the Airbnb case that I discussed where uh, Airbnb was allegedly trying to force people to take a travel voucher, well, if someone wanted the travel voucher and used the travel voucher and used it for a vacation and had a great time, they're, they're, that's someone you can easily identify. And so look to see what data you have your, uh, at your disposal to try and um, you know, move that process forward. Anything else you want to add? No, just thanks everybody for joining us and hopefully we'll have an update for you guys on the dark pattern uh, litigation in a couple of months. And, and thanks, Jenny and Frank. One other thing I wanted to mention real quick, we just got a, instead of a question, we got a comment in, and this is actually a really good piece of advice uh, that I'll mention real quick, and is to consider not outsourcing customer service uh, and to train your reps better because incompetent uh, customer service reps can cause a lot of reputation damage and lead to more legal actions, and that is exactly 100% right um, and is a good piece of advice. So with that, I think we will close. Thanks to everyone for attending today. Thanks to Frank and Jenny. And like Jenny said, we'll probably do another one of these at some point. And in the meantime, if you ever want to talk about this or have any questions, please feel free to contact us. Thank you so much.